In 1990, a well-trained group of athletes lost their lives on one of the highest mountains in the world, Mount Elbrus. There is always the risk of death at such heights, and there are a lot of ways to meet your doom. For this team, several simple factors were at play. Pride, cold weather, and the fact that when danger struck, the men were completely exhausted. However, there were some very chilling and inexplicable details to this story. And whatever happened is still a mystery. Elbrus is a stratovolcano in the Caucasus Mountains with a height of 5,642 meters, and it last erupted over 5,000 years ago. It is included in the seven summits list of the world's highest mountains, and it is the tallest peak in Russia and in Europe. Elbrus draws climbers from all over the world, and reaching the top is an important goal for all of them. Any self-respecting Russian climber considers it their duty to reach the peak, and I personally know several people who have climbed Elbrus who aren't even mountain climbers. Elbrus was conquered for the first time on July 22, 1829, as part of an expedition organized by the Russian Academy of Sciences. From that moment on, amateur climbers took to the slopes, ready to risk their lives to conquer this particularly tall and perilous peak. Meltwater from the numerous glaciers on Elbrus feeds the largest rivers in the Caucasus, the Kuban, Malka, and Baksan. The weather on the mountain is cyclical and unpredictable. Thick clouds give way to a clear sun before sudden flurries. Summers are humid and cool, but nevertheless great for climbing. Like on many other peaks, the climbing season usually begins in May, when spring comes and most of the snow melts. However, the peak remains wide year-round at altitudes higher than 5,000 meters. For many peoples of the Caucasus, like the Circassians, Adyghese, and Abkhazians, Elbrus is a sacred mountain called the Master of Spirits or Mountain of the Blessed. Its peak supposedly brings happiness and good luck, but unfortunately, that's not the case in today's story. In early May 1990, Sergei Levin led an expedition to Elbrus with five other well-trained men. Dr. Sergei Farbstein, Oleg Buldakov, Valery Udinsov, Oleg Varanin, and Vladislav Lazarev. Levin and Farbstein were expert mountaineers. For Levin's group, Elbrus was kind of a warm-up for a trip to the Pamir Mountains the next season, where they would search for Klochkov's group, which had also disappeared under mysterious circumstances. You can find my video about it in the link below. In addition, in May of 1990, there was a tour of Elbrus, and Levin and his comrades were asked to join as a so-called safety group. If someone got into trouble, it would be Levin and his friends who were to come to their aid. A so-called acclimatization trip was planned for May 2nd, after which they would return to the shelter to keep them from suffering from altitude sickness. Because there is little oxygen at high altitudes, the body must adapt. After living for three days on Elbrus at Shelter 11 at an altitude of 4,200 meters, Levin's group began its hike. At 2.30 p.m., as they were ascending, the team met another group of climbers on their way back down. A short conversation ensued. Levin told them they planned to climb a little higher, 4,500 meters, which was not too high for a well-prepared group that included two experienced mountaineers. Farbstein had already been to Elbrus twice, and Levin had been to the Pamirs at a height of about 6,000 meters. Forty minutes later, Levin's group stopped for a snack. Looking down the mountain, the men noticed that the weather had worsened. There was a strong wind and fog spread along the slope. Visibility became almost zero. The climbers realized that they needed to do something quickly. Their ascent, of course, had to be abandoned and it was too late to descend as well. Levin and his comrades dug out a snow cave and decided to spend the night on the slope. They didn't have tents because they weren't commonly taken on one-day climatization trips. The snow cave was the best option for them, and Levin felt that it was good practice for his group before they set off for the Pamirs. They radioed down their plans and went to bed. 
The group spent the night from May 2nd to the 3rd, warming themselves with a Primus stove and hoping that the weather would improve in the morning. However, it didn't. The wind reached 30 meters per second, temperatures fluctuated from 0 degrees Celsius to minus 5 degrees Celsius, and the humidity was very high. Nevertheless, they decided to try to go back. Farbstein became ill and started stumbling, apparently under the effects of severe mountain sickness, which can easily overtake even the most well-trained climbers. In addition, he was wearing glasses, and because of the snow, humidity, and fog, he practically couldn't see at all. According to acquaintances, he was almost blind in the snow. They had not yet undergone full acclimatization, and mountain sickness could have struck any of them. Their plans to descend were thwarted, but they ran into two Japanese mountain climbers who were also trying to go down. Noting that these men didn't have enough equipment and were also stuck on the slope, Levin's group invited them to share the snow cave with them, realizing that if they did not help their new friends, they could die. The snow cave the Tim had built was good enough. They had dug two spacious rooms and even managed to heat them with the help of a stove. However, soon one of the chambers collapsed and the climbers no longer had the strength to fix it. Eight people were cramped into a narrow room just a few square meters in size. Despite the fact that they were clearly not in the best condition, Levin continued reporting by radio to the leadership of the tour that everything was fine. Asking for help would have been a major blow to their reputations, and he wanted to avoid that no matter what. He was an experienced and careful climber, but it was hard to admit defeat. In addition, it would have been dangerous to send help. What if the rescuers got lost in the snow and fog? On May 3rd, however, during his evening call, Levin finally asked for help. We're counting on support, he said, pointing out that both he and his comrades were in a dangerous situation. The next morning, a group led by Leonid Eberl tried to make it to them, but they couldn't reach the climbers due to heavy fog, so they retreated back to Shelter 11. Levin decided to stay in the cave one more night and not attempt to descend. This was a fatal mistake. That night, the fragile cave was covered with snow and it became hard for the man to breathe. The Primus stove was emitting carbon dioxide. Levin, Lazarev, and Varanin, the three who were strong enough, crawled out of the cave and began digging out the rest. Once outside, the men found that the weather had finally cleared up and Shelter 11 was visible. However, Farbson was completely exhausted and was in no condition to make the trip. Levin and the team refused to leave their comrade behind, but they should have probably risked it, because that night, Boldakov began behaving erratically, apparently also having severe mountain sickness. Levin nonetheless decided not to send anyone down for help, hoping that in the morning they would be able to go down or help would come for them. So they waited for dawn in the cave. No one knows exactly what happened that night, but on the morning of May 4th, Odinsov woke up alone in a snow-filled cave and dug himself out. It took him an hour and he emerged cold and wet, but alive. However, he was shocked at what he found on the snowy slope. Near the entrance to the cave were the bodies of Levin, Lazarev, and Varanin, who had gone out at night to repair the dwelling. Two more men, Farbstein and Boldakov, lay unconscious inside the cave. One of the Japanese men was missing and the second was in the cave and seemed okay. Arinsov began descending, and on his way down, he met rescuers searching for the missing Japanese group. He showed them the way to the cave and continued descending. The rescuers reached the cave and began taking Boldakov back to the station. He was in a very bad condition, and on the way, they realized he had no pulse. Farbstein was still alive and was taken to the shelter, but he died of hypothermia, never regaining consciousness. The missing Japanese man was found not far from the cave. He apparently decided to make his way down and fell into a crevasse where he froze. In the end, only Odinsov and the other Japanese climber survived. One reason for the tragedy seems simple. Levin had not been entirely upfront over the radio about the conditions of his team, how cold and wet it was in the cave, and the severity of their mountain sickness. 
However, other things make this tragedy seem almost like another Dyatlov Pass. First, a broken walkie-talkie was found near the cave, and it had clearly been broken on purpose. Who did it, and why? Had there been a conflict between someone in the group? Expensive equipment was also missing from the cave, a clamp, and four made adjustable walking poles. These things, of course, could have been taken by unscrupulous rescuers, but who really knows? There were as many as 52 ice drilling hooks found there, which is a lot, especially for a short acclimatization hike. Such hooks were simply unnecessary. This inspired various theories about why the men would have so many hooks. What if they had lied about their route? Did they have some kind of secret mission? Were they following secret orders from the government? The answer may be simple. In all likelihood, they had brought extra Soviet titanium hooks to exchange for Western equipment from foreigners. Soviet hooks were highly valued in the mountaineering community, and it was the easiest way to barter for better clothes. This, of course, doesn't fully explain the need to carry so many hooks for one day. How many foreigners were they planning on meeting during one acclimatization trip? A pool of blood was also found in the snow cave, and how it got there is unknown. Maybe it was Boldakov's blood. He had been found with wounds on his head and face, and how he ended up that way was also a mystery. Or maybe someone had vomited blood. The strangest find, however, was found in the stomach of one of the men. For some unknown reason, it was filled with the hair of another climber, whose hair was not specified. That's freaky enough. Had they actually gotten that hungry? Or was it mountain sickness that made them act so strangely? The three who died in front of the cave were lying in the snow half-dressed. Some had no outer clothing. Their pants were down and unbuttoned. And some were missing shoes. It was all very strange. Moreover, a little lower down the slope, a group of novice climbers in tents had suffered through the same bad weather. They were cold and tired, but they had survived and made their way to the bottom themselves. It was soon announced that Levin and his team had died of hypothermia. But how could this have happened to such an experienced group? Climbing Elbrus should have been a cakewalk. The route they picked wasn't that hard, and there is no reason they couldn't have returned to the shelter alive. There are many theories about what happened on that slope, from the most banal to Bigfoot aliens and special ops commandos. Since we have no physical evidence of alien intervention, will address only theories that are supported by at least a shred of evidence. The first theory claims that Farpstein, being a doctor, decided to test some kind of experimental medicine on himself and his comrades in order to increase their endurance, and something went wrong. A cover-up like that was possible in the Soviet Union, and given how in those days they hid anything that might cast a shadow on the image of their great country, perhaps that's what happened. However, there is no proof. Another theory seems more rational. Maybe Eleven didn't report all the details of what happened in their cave, and he significantly overestimated his strength and the strength of his men. He didn't want to disturb the leadership of the tour because his team was the safety group, and it was their job to save people, not be saved. By the time he asked for help, it was too late. There is another theory that Levin's group was doing something that needed to be kept from the public. There is information that Leonid Eberl, the rescuer who first went to save Levin and his team, called Odinsov aside when he finally came down the mountain, and they had a long talk. What their conversation was about, however, is unknown, and there is no record of it. It is said that after this conversation, Odinsov slightly changed his testimony about what happened on the slope. It is most likely that several factors were at play. First, the men had lit their stove in the cave, and the small enclosure very quickly filled with carbon dioxide and other toxic gases, for example, hydrocyanic acid, which could be released from alcohol to kindle the primus, making it hard to breathe. Three of them got out, and not in the best mental and physical condition, were disoriented and got lost. Their clothes were warm, but not designed for several days of grueling survival in cold snow. Down retains heat well, but only if it is completely dry. 
The next factor was that the group started suffering from hypoxia associated with altitude sickness. At the time of their acclimatization hike, Levin's group was in the slopes of Elbrus for only a few days and had not yet had time to get used to the rarefied mountain air. Due to the lack of oxygen, the body begins to die slowly. One by one, internal organs shut down before finally the heart and brain give out. Odinsov and the Japanese climber were saved by the fact that the other Japanese alpinists decided to leave the cave and apparently broke through one of its walls, letting in fresh air. The night wasn't too windy and cold, so they didn't freeze to death. Another issue was Levin's pride. By not calling for help earlier, he lost precious hours when his comrades could be saved. In general, staying in the cave for several nights is a bad idea. Their clothes got wet, and mountain sickness reached the point where apparently complete chaos reigned. Somebody ate hair, someone threw and broke a walkie-talkie, and someone fell and got hurt or maybe vomited blood, causing a dark brown puddle to appear on the floor. In the dark, it would have been impossible to know what was happening, and the Japanese climber, who was apparently in better condition than the rest, decided to try to go for help. In the end, the director of the tour, Sergei Hudaev, was banned from a leadership role for tourist groups for two years. He was given a rather mild punishment because, of course, he couldn't have saved Levin's group anyway, especially not knowing what was really happening to them. This theory doesn't explain all the details of what went down. Some facts will forever remain a mystery, perhaps filed in a long-forgotten classified archive. In an article about the tragedy for the Volny Vatar newspaper, mountaineer Evgeny Buyanov wrote about his acquaintances who died on Albers. I will always carry with me the vivid memory of my comrades. There is no point in talking about guilt for what happened. Guilt is not universal, but rather judicial, and serves only to determine punishment. Of course, they did not deserve the punishment that fell upon them. By their death, they bequeathed to us, the living, the lesson to not repeat mistakes. Which ones? Perhaps we understand. Similar strange stories, of course, have happened and constantly occur in the mountains, especially at heights such as these, where radio communications don't work well and the weather cannot be fully predicted. What do you think? Did they really just go crazy from altitude sickness and freeze? Or did something mysterious happen? Let me know in the comments. Check out my other videos, subscribe to my channel, and as always, stay safe.